So lecture five, we're going to get all familiar with our data and we'll throw a bit of coding in too. Shut up and sit down. So here we are in lecture five. If you're on schedule, this is kind of teaching week eight, stretch it to teaching week nine. This, if it's still if it's teaching week nine, it's fine. But it, it's um, on the Moodle site for teaching week eight. So this week and the next two weeks are all building up to our discussion in our third and final online tutorial in week 11. Now, we're going to try and do a practical in this video. That's quite a challenging thing to do. So we're not really going to do it, but I'm just going to ask you to do some stuff. You know, it's hard to do a practical via video. Um, now, uh, because this, you know, it's because it's recorded. You know, I don't get a sense of you actually getting your hands dirty here. You know, you might be just chilling in the pool with a cocktail or something. So, you know, if I ask you to do things, I don't know if you're actually doing them. So, so I'm going to ask you to do things, but you do them outside of this video, if that makes sense. So I'm hoping you will get involved because I think it'll be a good learning experience for you. What I've asked you to do is and I'm asking you to do is read the full transcript of the body art focus group. This is on our Moodle site. This is a transcript of a focus group. This is the text that I want you to practice your analysis on. And the analysis we're going to do is thematic analysis. Now you can download the transcript from the companion site to our textbook as well if you don't have access to Moodle. Um, you can access the textbook without buying the textbook I think. Anyway. Um, just go to the student, when you go to the companion website, go to the, to the textbook, go to the student resources and select qualitative data and then click on the body art focus group transcript. The audio file is also available there, which you might find interesting as the audio will capture more than is in the transcript. There's a real risk of working from transcripts, which is that, you know, written words are not the same as spoken words. They just aren't. So when you're reading a transcript, you know, a lot of the times transcript can, you know, you read a transcript of your own interview and you just think, oh God, what a moron I am. And, but that's because we speak differently to how we write. Okay, so it's worth listening to the audio recording as well. Now this week, um, we're doing familiarization coding. So um, you need to read the full transcript as that will be the fam familiarization element. And we're only gonna code a small part of the transcript, which I've detailed on our Moodle page under week eight. We are, where we're heading to is week 11, where what, we're, what I want us to do is get together and discuss our analysis, you know, how we've interpreted that focus group differently. This should give you a great idea of what thematic analysis is all about and how actually we all do it kind of differently in terms of we come up with different um, analyses. So let's get going. Here's a list of all the things we're going to achieve and you can see that it's all about how to use coding in thematic analysis. Now, there are six phases in thematic analysis and we're going to focus on phases two and three. Now, note that we're talking about phases, not steps. That should give you an idea that we're not talking about a linear process where one follows two, which is followed by three and so on. That's very linear, Sheriff. Rather, we can move from phase one to phase two and then return to phase one. It's an iterative rather than a linear process. So familiarization. This is the key to all good analysis. It, it's when you immerse yourself in your data to get to know your data. So for you, it will mean you read, reread, maybe read for the third time the transcript as well as listen to the audio recording. Now, you may be short of time, so don't worry if you can't do this, uh, but know that it is what you should be doing. You should read and reread and reread and reread, really become familiar with the transcript. Should we keep reading? And to the audio recording. Uh, you need to do that if you want to come up with some really good analysis. Now, when you're reading, you want to be actively reading, which means you want to be asking questions of the text, things like, why did they say this? And what did they mean by that? And so on. You should also ask, um, after a couple of readings, you should start taking down notes of what you think the data means. But you're not wanting to turn 
your notes into themes yet, just hold on, you know? Be patient. Look at wow. What's the rush? Now this process of familiarization is important because it engages you with your data. And that's what your coding will rely on. And will this will lead to the best qualitative coding. It's because you know your data better if you read it and reread it and reread it. And you really need to know your data. Data being relayed to Mr. Spock. Reading's coming in now, Kevin. You know, I, I bet you make more sense of someone you know well than a stranger. You know, more sense of what's uh, going on for them. You know, so when, when friends tell us how they're feeling, we get a better sense of how they're feeling when a stranger does because we don't know them so well. Anyway, you get the idea, don't you? So here's some of the questions you can ask yourself that will guide you through that process of familiarization. This has been modified slightly from our textbook. So here you see the different ways we might question the data, particularly in relation to how participants are making sense of the topic and how we might have responded to the question ourselves. This will help you understand the assumptions you're bringing to the analysis. It is this reflexive engagement that underpins qualitative data analysis. Now, whilst you're doing this, you need to take notes and you can make notes in the margin of your transcript or in a separate notebook. But however you do it, um, you want to eventually pull all, of those, pull all of those reflections together to make sense of them as a whole, you know, separate from the transcript. At some point, you move away from the transcript. Oh, give me that transcript. Now, in the old days, you had to print things out, and then you got your scissors and your tape, uh, your, your, your tape out, <laughs> and you, you cut and taped things together to get your notes all in order. Um, of course, these days, you can just cut and paste using word processing software. What a wonderful world we live in there, now, don't we? Now, before we dive into coding, it's good to remind ourselves of the main factors in qualitative research. So we're focused on understanding, and it's a flexible approach. Often it's an iterative approach. It's also a subjective and interpretive process and relies on the reflexivity of the researcher. We also need to get as close as we can to our data, which is what that process of familiarization was all about. We're not seeking to be distant and objective to our data. Now, coding is the process of identifying aspects of the data that relate to your research question. There are two phases of coding in thematic analysis. First, you decide what part of your data you're going to code. You could code the whole lot, or you could code a particular part, say from one particular participant, or when participants talk about one particular topic or the response to one particular question. Now, you usually do this when your data set is very large. You know, it's just too much data to process or analyze all at once. There's too much data. So in our reading for week two, the paper by Farvard and Braun was selective coding. The project was much bigger. It was more broadly on heterosexual sexual experiences. The authors used selective coding as the basis of their paper, which was on the topic of casual sex in particular, just one part of the data that they collected. Now, complete coding is where you code the whole data set in one go. You usually do this in smaller projects, you know, because you, you, <laughs> you can do it all in one go when the data isn't too large. Now, after you've completed the coding for all the data, you may then go on to select parts for particular publications. Now, phase two is where you then start to reduce your coding to something that is manageable. So what is coding? What is it you actually do? Well, you're really putting labels on your data. You're labeling segments that are of interest and saying why they are of interest. It's really a process of data reduction. You can easily end up with 30 or 40 pages of transcript from a single hour long interview. So even small projects can generate a lot of text. So coding is a way to reduce that text into something that is manageable. And you're kind of summarizing the data with phrases and then keywords or codes, and then organizing those codes into meaningful patterns. It's quite a rigorous process and it's iterative. So once you have a code, you may go back to the data to check that the code works or that in light of new codes you develop, whether earlier codes need to change. So it takes a lot of time and you're constantly going to and from your codes to your data. It's not unusual um, for an hour long interview to take around four, even up to eight hours to code because of this process. 
Yes, but it's hard to put an exact figure on how long it will take. It depends on the data and on the researcher and on the quality of the coffee being consumed by the researcher. Maybe you need some more coffee. So, this is a way of thinking about coding. Your codes are the building blocks of analysis, you know, bricks and wooden planks. The themes are developed from the codes. Themes are the walls and the roof that are built from the bricks and the wood. So what is a good code in thematic analysis? Well, it's not an easy question to answer. There are no right or wrongs in, in qualitative paradigm, you know, because there's no objective truth to, as to, you know, what we might be wrong or right about. But there are some ways that are more useful than others. So codes that contain enough information about the content are good codes, ones that are self-explanatory. So take your data away, take your transcripts away, read your codes, and if you know what the data is from the code, it's a good code. If your code is, for example, lifestyle behavior, that might be too general. You know, you might not get a sense of what that data was actually telling you. Data inaccurate, does not compute. Um, yeah, too general. It might not capture your data. So you go back to your data and find a code that better captures the data. Also, codes need to be mutually discrete, i.e. not to overlap with each other. But they also need to capture the nuances in your data. Now, there are two types of code, semantic codes, also called data-derived or descriptive codes. And this is built on what participants actually say, mirroring what they say. This is quite surface level. There are also latent codes, which are interpretative codes. And these go beyond what a participant says and reflects underlying meanings of patterns. These are more focused on ideas, concepts, and assumptions upon which the participant's thoughts rest. Hmm, that gives me an idea. Now, when you're new to research, you often find your analysis is more semantic than latent. And the more experienced researchers, and I would say the better quality analysis, moves from the semantic to latent coding. I've had quite a bit of experience, and I assure you, Chris has no latent maniacal tendencies. Now here's the coding process. First you start with your transcript, as you read it, um, you keep your research question in mind and you start, then you start your coding, you try to include everything that is any relevance to your research question. Uh, so be inclusive, um, you, in, you even include things that you're not sure if they're related to the research question, just include them anyway. Um, just a, a sniff of a possible relevance to your research question should be enough for you to include it, you know, so it's inclusive. Um, you need to spend a lot of time doing this, a lot of time doing the analysis. Um, then you start reflecting on your codes you've developed and think whether they are as good as they can be and what degree they reflect the thinking um, of your participant rather than your thinking. Um, you know, you're in a process of constantly revising your codes based on the data your and your reflexivity. Now, it's almost impossible to get a sense of what coding is without trying it yourself, which is why, as part of this and the next few lectures, I'll be asking you to undertake your own coding of the Body Art Focus Group transcript. Now, you can find an example of coding in your textbook from pages 208 to 209, also available from the textbook's companion website. And I've also put this up on our Moodle site under week eight. And I've also put up an example of how that transcript has been coded by a colleague of mine, Danielle Every, who ran this unit in 2008. Now, if you can't access Moodle, sorry, but you know, I guess you're not enrolled in the unit. Uh, I'm sure you'll find your own resources to help you out. You know, Google. Finally, just a, a word about using computer software to code your data. There are a number of programs that are out there they're good in terms of helping you organize your data and great for conducting quick searches of your data. Sometimes they're used because people believe they improve the rigor of their analysis. Now, anything done with a computer program sounds like it's professional and scientific. Science stations gather data for computer banks. Now, whilst computer software is useful, particularly when you're sharing analysis amongst a team, Beware of falling into this trap of scientism that is actually a shorthand for positivism or quantitative research. First, using computers removes you from your data. You know, you start letting the computer read your transcripts rather than reading the transcripts yourself. You know, you, you, 
you just get your computer to read the text, search for keywords and deliver you those keywords to show you where those keywords in your text are. So your computer's reading your transcripts, you aren't. It can also be tempting to start counting frequencies in your data, how many times a theme appears, a keyword appears, because computers are very good at counting. That's what computers are. They're counting machines, you know? Also, a computer program is only as good as the person using it. Computers can't do analysis for us. They can do statistical analysis, but they can't undertake qualitative analysis. Computers don't yet have the lived experience upon which to base its understanding of your research data. The human thing, you wouldn't understand. My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are difficult. You mean you're a designer? Yes. So use computer software, but use it with caution and care and with the right sort of expectations. So that's all for now. Next is lecture eight. No, no it's not. No, it's not. It's week eight. Numbers. This is week eight. Next is lecture six, where we'll be getting ready for teaching week nine. Should be ready for you for teaching week nine. So till then, practice your coding with the transcript up on our Moodle site, and um, ta-da!